Welcome to part two of my conversation with Simon Black. Hope you enjoy the remainder of this conversation. Once again, if you're new to RTD, click the subscribe button for more RTD interviews as well as monetary news updates. Enjoy. So the palatable idea is they say, let's default on the obligations to the citizens to maintain a sound currency. And so we'll just engineer inflation. That's always been the long-term uh, solution. And if you look back in history, they're pretty much every government that runs into problems, they always solve this problem by debasing the currency. You know, inflation is a form of theft, and it's a, it's, a, it's a most insidious form of theft. It's extremely clever, really, because you steal a little bit at a time from people. You know, if they sent the cops to your door and they said, hey, you know, give me $20,000 right now, there would be rioting in the streets. People would go nuts. Uh, it, it would, I mean, it would be Armageddon. Everybody had to cough up, you know, twenty, thirty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, you know, per household to the government. So they're never going to do that. So instead, they'll say, "Oh, well, we'll just, you know, we'll just steal, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year in purchasing power in a way that nobody, you know, nobody's ever going to notice." And they call it inflation. And the most clever part about inflation is that they've convinced people that it's normal. You can go read any high school economics textbook, and they, they actually teach kids this, that, oh, they say, oh, well, inflation is, you know, 2%, 3%. That's totally fine. That's totally normal. And they convince people that that's just normal to lose 2 to 3% per year. And, of course, people will go, yeah, 2%, no big deal. And, yeah, 2% is no big deal until you see the long-term compounding effects of this year after year after year after year after year. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, man, I'm 38 years old. I remember stuff – how much stuff cost when I was a kid. And I look at these things now and I think, my God, you know, what, what, I remember the days when, you know, all these things were, were so cheap. <laughs> now, well, I said, that, with that same concept there, I was, I was telling, uh, you know, some younger ones, the younger kids not long ago about, you know, what you could actually purchase for a dollar, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And I remember actually yeah. looking forward to getting a single dollar to go to the store to grab, you know, two or three items and having a blast with, whereas now, I'll give you a dollar now. You're not going to get anything with it. So hence the, the title, Rethinking the Dollar. So that's right. Uh, let's, let's get into currencies real quick. Uh, so having traveled the world a little bit, you keep your eye on currencies. You deal with different currencies all the time. Let's talk about some of the, 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 the banning of cash, whether it be in India, what's happening with the hyperinflation in Venezuela. I know uh, South African RAND, I, I read some of your work you've done with that uh, a while back about South African RAND currency being you know cheap right now. So give me, give me your take on the whole currency fiasco we're facing globally. Well, uh, a lot of issues there. Let's start with the cash bans. I mean, uh, cash is something that uh, – cash is going away. I think you have to recognize that. I, I mean, I, I know you do, and, and I'm sure a lot of your viewers do. There's, there's zero benefit to cash. Uh, the, the governments have zero benefit in cash. There's nothing about cash that benefits them in every way. Every possible benefit to them is if cash is banned. Yeah. If you think about it – a ban on cash to them means that there's, you know, that there's less tax evasion, so they get more tax revenue. That's a huge bonus for them. Uh, it means there's no, uh, you know, it means there's limited financial privacy, which means they can, you know, all of their spy agencies can can snoop around and see what people are doing with the money. That's a big benefit to them. Um, it also, more importantly, means that uh, it reduces uh, risk of bank runs, because uh, when you think about it, what happens when people feel like there's a a problem in the banking system, people go down to the banks and they try and withdraw their money mm -hmm. um, in cash. And if people did that, it would completely bankrupt the entire banking system. Um, this is this goes back to you know financial and monetary literacy. Um, you know, banks and, and my team, my analysts, we we look at this stuff all the time. Uh, we we crunch the numbers on bank balance sheets and turn these things inside out and see that you know banks actually maintain very very low levels of liquidity in terms of, you know, most of the money, if you go and you deposit $100 at a bank, they're going to take at least $99 and go invest that in stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of those might be extremely illiquid. They might put it in home loans and mortgages and, and uh, uh, different commercial loans and things like that, some of which is very difficult for them to sell. And so if you show up one day and you say, hey, I want my money back, they don't have it. Right um, now, the idea is that they can maintain this very, very low level. I mean, I'm talking three percent, two percent, one percent of their assets they keep uh, in in liquid form. The rest of the stuff is off and, and invested, and in, in God knows what. So, you know, if people actually went and and decided to take their money out of the bank, it would cause a huge problem for the bank because then banks, in order to meet that obligation to customers, would have to start selling assets. 
right? And uh, in order to raise the cash to give their customers. Now, if that happened at one bank and only one bank, it would be a big deal. But if there were a, a system-wide crisis where everybody was going to every bank saying, I want my money back, and every bank was simultaneously selling assets, what does that mean? It means that if every bank is dumping assets in the marketplace, then asset prices tank, right? Because everybody's selling at the same time. There's no buyers. Everybody's a seller, which means asset prices tank. And if asset prices start falling all at the same time, then it means that the banks are going through their, their, their asset values are falling, which means they're burning through their capital, which means the banks themselves might actually end up being rendered insolvent. So it ends up creating, it creates a, a greater systemic crisis because if the banks don't have enough liquidity, then it can cause the banks themselves to go under. Right. So if, ca if cash is banned, then customers as depositors, we don't have that option anymore. We can't go down to the bank and say, give me my money back because we don't have cash anymore. And so this, this prevents customers from being able to withdraw their money out of the system. It, it's a form of capital control because it prevents us from taking our money out of a system that we disagree with. It traps our money in a system that has a lot of problems. Um, and so, we, again, we, we've seen this uh, in a lot of places in Cyprus in 2013. They just froze the banking system and said, hey, uh, every bank on this, in this country is insolvent. But, uh, you know, tough luck. We're going to freeze everybody's account and prevent you from being able to withdraw any money whatsoever. And, you know, that's, that, that, that happened. And so, I mean, anybody that didn't have cash went through a lot of problems uh, in that. Um, but it, it, this is a good thing for the banking system because it prevents that systemic crisis, and so all, and that, which is obviously beneficial to the government as well. And so every possible advantage to the government is if there's a ban on cash. There's no advantage to the government if cash is still flowing in the system, physical cash. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you have to look at this and think, you know, there's going to be a, a slow and gradual uh, it, and, until eventually there's a very sudden push to say, we're getting rid of cash. Um, we're seeing this in India now. We've seen this in, I mean, we've seen this in a lot of countries, really, this, uh, you know, these very sharp, uh, acute cash bans that have taken place. And I think over time we'll continue to see um, – uh, you know, legislation and regulations that uh, that ban cash are seeing calls to they'll say, oh, only terrorists and, and criminals use cash. Uh, and so, you know, that's why we have to get rid of this stuff. And, and we're seeing academics talk about this. We're seeing politicians talk about this. So I think this is, uh, you know, this, this is this is as close as it gets to a near certainty. Uh, it's just a question of time. You know, how long is it going to take? Is it going to take two years or is it going to take 10 years? That I don't know, but the trend is pretty obvious that uh, you know the cash is going away. Right. Um, I think I think cash is something that makes sense for people to hold now, but I would also encourage people to hold other real assets, transportable assets, um, universally marketable and recognizable assets, and obviously you know gold and silver are are, are two of those that make a lot of sense. Right, right. Now, so we've done a good job of painting uh, the picture of what's wrong and and how bad things could get. Now let's talk about some solutions. And so I know you're a good man. As far as on your website, you talk about different ways of second passport, you know, traveling abroad. You actually give people insight into some good places to probably relocate if you had the funds to do so. So as of right now, next question is, you know, based upon all the places you've gone to, what's what's the what's a not a safe because there's no places safe from what's going to occur, but what is a good place where opportunity is already present, where it'll be minimum exposure to all the craziness that may happen in the developed worlds. I, I see opportunity everywhere, mm -hmm. honestly. I mean, I'm I'm talking to you right now. I'm in Chile. I spend a lot of time here. I, I could probably travel to, you know, 40 different countries a year, mm -hmm. um, although I do spend several months a year in Chile. And the primary reason I'm here is, is uh, so many business opportunities. Um, a couple of years ago, I founded one of the largest, um, what's now one of the largest agriculture companies in Latin America. Mm -hmm. We produce uh, blueberries and walnuts and, and have – um, fifty million dollars worth of farms down here, mm -hmm. um, and and you know I did that primarily because I wanted to invest in real assets. Um, I wanted to get um, other people who were of like mind invested in real assets. So we put together a, a you know great project to invest in real assets because real assets are the things that that you know stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. um, Chile was an obvious place to do that simply because the land costs and the operating costs and so forth are so much cheaper than they are in California or uh, you know southern Spain or, or other places that have similar Mediterranean climate. Um, but it's just an example of things that you know I see I really do see opportunity um, all over the world and I would encourage people to again go back it goes back to that financial literacy that is I am convinced 
the best investment you can make is the investment you make in yourself and in your own education uh, because that is going to open up so many more doors and so many more opportunities um, where you start seeing, you know, I've got all this uh, paper money and if you've got, if you have U.S. dollars right now, if you have, if, if you have any savings at all in U.S. dollars, first of all, congratulations because you're already richer than 99% of everybody else on the planet. It might not feel like it sometimes, but even, you know, the, you know, even, even people that are, you know, in the, in, in even, I would say the lower middle class, um, in a in a developed country are much better off if you have a literally a dollar in your pocket you're better off than than you know guys that I've seen in Bangladesh and Tanzania and, and, and so forth that you know that, that have absolutely nothing um, and and as well access to educational resources many of which are completely free online uh, to be able to learn more about uh, what's happening, to be able to learn more about as well the opportunities uh, and so forth, and to leverage that knowledge into uh, something that can that can actually become productive for you. Yeah. There are a lot of defensive strategies. I, I look at. I know you're a sports guy. I look at it um, as you know it, as a sports analogy, and I say you know any great sports team. You know Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player in the world because he played great offense and defense, mm -hmm. and I think that's the way to be a champion is to be able to play great offense and great defense. Um, defense is probably the most important. Uh, and I think, you know, any, any great coach and any great athlete will tell you that, you know, defense is critical. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to prevent the other guy from scoring. And in this case, that means being able to safeguard what you have. You have savings. You need to be able to safeguard everything that you've worked for um, uh, from – these risks that are obvious, and we talked about these obvious risks. You've got a central bank with no capital. You've got a government with twenty trillion in debt that wants to go out and spend trillions of dollars more. You know they're obvious risks, and in light of those obvious risks, you know play good defense. Look at what those risks are. Understand the consequences, and that's a question of investment in your education. And once you've invested in your education, take some of those strategies, and and they're very particular. They're very individual. Some people have more savings and more money. Uh, some people have less savings and less money. Some people are about to retire. Some people are just getting started. Some people have kids to worry about. There's so many different scenarios depending on your situation, and you learn about you can learn about those things, and and figure out what's the best defense for you. And but once you've done that. There's all these other great opportunities out there. That's when you can learn how to play great offense. And when you learn about great offense, then you can see there's this world of opportunity out there. You can see there's just some tremendous things that are going on in different corners of the world that you might not even have any experience with or exposure to whatsoever. But again, that's where that education comes in to play and learning about those offensive tactics and learning basically how to be that how to be that great champion, learning how to play both great offense and great defense. And that's fundamentally the solution, and it starts – with uh, awareness of the problems, it starts with education. Right. Well, last question, and then I'll let you go. I appreciate you being, uh, uh, you know, free with your time. Rethinking the dollars, the name of the show. My goal is to basically begin to help people rethink everything they've never been taught about finances or monetary history and awareness. So, give us your thoughts and just to look ahead. You know, the Federal Reserve note, two, five, ten years from now, will it still exist? What will it look like? What will it feel like? In your opinion, of course, no one knows. But what do you think? Well, I like how you put it, uh, the Federal Reserve note, because the, the U.S. dollar is defined by the U.S. Mint and Coinage Act of 1792. Um, yeah, what we have, the pieces of paper we have right now are exactly that. They're Federal Reserve notes. Uh, where does the Federal Reserve note go? Uh, you know, look, uh, the long-term trend to me is pretty clear. Uh, in the in, in the in the long term, it's you know the dollar is is uh, is losing its its share of, uh, of of the global market as the as the single only dominant global reserve currency. Uh, there are other competitors. Uh, more importantly, there's technology, and technology is now getting to the point where we don't need a highly centralized. Federal Reserve with unelected officials controlled by commercial banks to manipulate the value of the currency. Now we have all this technology now that makes all that stuff totally obsolete. Uh, and so the dollar, I think, becomes uh, less and less important as time goes on uh, and the more and more of these risks become exposed. It's entirely possible that, you know, over the long term, we could very well see uh, a widespread severe currency crisis as a result of these fundamentals. Um, it's also possible that I become the starting quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, so, so, so we'll see. In the short term, however, uh, it's it's basically you know who's the you know who's the least ugly contestant at the beauty pageant. Uh, every fiat currency suffers the same fundamental challenges. Uh, you know, there's no there's there's very few great fiat currencies. There are some that are better capitalized than others. Uh, the Hong Kong Central Bank, for example, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, is 
uh, dramatically uh, better capitalized than just about every other central bank in the world. Um, Norway's central bank is better capitalized than most other central banks. There's a few outliers, but most paper currencies basically share the same uh, fundamentals. And so, you know, when people look at look around, they're looking for something to hold. They go, "Okay, geez, where do I go?" If you're if you're an institution, right, and you're holding on to, you got 150 billion dollars to manage. Are you going to put your money in in Europe? Uh, with their negative interest rates, or are you going to put your money in Japan with its negative interest rates, or are you going to put your money in the U.S. with its slightly positive interest rates? You know, that's the reality. Is that for institutional capital flows, for you know, whether you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars, you don't have very many options of where you can park that money. You know, a hedge fund manager with 150 billion dollars can't can't put 150 billion dollars worth of of, of uh, investment funds to work in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica's Cologne, yeah. for example, the Costa Rican Cologne that currency is too small to absorb that much capital. So you have to go into one of these huge markets. That means the euro, the yen, the dollar, and maybe now kind of sort of the renminbi because they're opening up. You don't have a lot of options. And so between those options right now, the dollar is sort of the least ugly of those currencies. And so people are putting the money in the dollar. But that, I think, is just another symptom of how how completely screwed up the financial system is, is that you're sort of forced, compelled to put your money in a currency that you know is fundamentally unsound because the other ones are even worse. Uh, and so the long term of that, I think, is fairly obvious. It's just a question of time. The short term, I think we could actually continue to see uh, U.S. dollar strength, uh, or at least stability in the levels that we are right now, uh, to me that's an opportunity to trade your overvalued pieces of paper for a real asset of value, particularly real assets you might find that's undervalued. And that's, I think, the best advice I give anybody right now. All right. Well, Simon Black, uh, as we draw towards the end, uh, share with our, our listeners where they can find you at and some of the free material you have available and what they can find in, in, in that free material there for you. Oh, the primary thing is is probably sovereignman.com. Um, you know, people can find a lot of resources there. Um, we send out a, a a note to people every day, talk about what's happening in the world, what we're seeing. Um, you know, I've got some different insights because I travel a lot, but also because I run so many businesses in so many different places around the world. I've got agriculture here. I've got manufacturing in Australia. Um, I started a bank a couple of years ago. A lot of different business interests uh, all over the world. So it's an interesting window of opportunity. We talk about this a lot uh, on that site. So that's Sovereignman.com and, uh, and uh, lots of uh, free material and resources there for anybody to look at. All right. Well, Simon, I appreciate you sitting down with me. Look forward to continuing to follow your work and uh, hear about your travels and also to learn and stay in tune with what you have going on. So I appreciate you sitting down with us. Thanks very much.